so in last session we discussed reading 56 which was about ethics and uh, ethics and trust in investment profession and today we are going to cover reading 57 plus reading 58 reading 57 and 58 we are going to do it no on a combined basis because the readings are not different the only thing is that in reading 57 they have just given an introduction to standards of professional conduct and then in reading 58 they have gone in depth so we will be doing reading 57 and 58 together we will try and cover both the readings in two sessions so let us start the discussion and in this reading we are going to discuss two, two things the first thing which we are going to discuss is code of ethics and the second thing which we are going to discuss is standards of professional conduct now these standards are very very important from exam perspective because 90 percent of the question in ethics will be asked from standards right and maybe one or two questions may be asked from code of ethics i don't think more than one question they're going to ask from code of ethics but before starting a code of ethics there is a one important point here which you need to understand. It says what CFA Institute has a professional conduct program. There is something called professional conduct program. And what is the relevance of professional conduct program? It is important for us to understand. So what it says, the CFA Institute professional conduct program, basically this program they have designed on the basis of, you know what, there is something called principle of fairness. So in professional conduct program, they have outlined certain principles, right? And all those principles are based on fairness, which means what? As an investment advisor, it is your du duty to treat all your clients fairly. Fairly does not mean equally. That also we are going to discuss. But it says it should be based on the principle of fairness, right? What is the role of the CFA? institute professional conduct program right so there are some people who are a part of this committee of professional conduct program and all those people what they do they conduct any sort of an inquiry which comes related to professional conduct of a member now it is important for you to understand who are cfa institute members so let me categorize it so cfa institute gives membership also and how you can attain that membership and who can be a part of CFA Institute who can be a CFA Institute member any CFA candidate who has enrolled for any program all CFA charter holders who are CFA charter holders all those people who have cleared all the three levels of CFA and have attained three years of work experience they are given CFA charter holder degree all CFA candidates, whether uh, somebody is a CFA level 1 candidate, level 2 candidate or level 3 candidate, all those people can become member, uh, can become a member of CFA Institute, right? So membership is given to CFA candidates, CFA charter holders. If someone is not doing CFA, is he eligible to become a member of CFA Institute? Yes, he can. So there is no requirement of just giving CFA exam to become a CFA Institute member. Anybody can become a member of CFA Institute, whether he is going for any CFA program, any level, or even if he is not a CFA charter holder, he can take the membership of CFA Institute. Now, the point is, if you are a CFA Institute member, and if any inquiry comes related to your professional conduct, so if you are working in investment management industry and if any complaint or any inquiry comes related to your professional conduct, that inquiry will be conducted by the CFA Institute Professional Conduct Program. So there are certain members who are a part of the CFA. No, professional sir, your voice conduct. is breaking. No, sir, it's clear. Clear is, sir. Who is saying his voice is breaking? Sir, break over. So, 
any query comes related to conduct of any CFA Institute member that inquiry will be conducted by CFA Institute professional conduct program and there are certain people who are a member of the CFA Institute professional conduct program right now what sort of a query comes let's say if you are a member of CFA Institute right and you have made certain disclosure self disclosures right about there's something called professional conduct statement so when you become a member of CFA Institute you have to sign something called professional conduct statement in which it will be written that you will be you know follow all the ethical principles laid down by CFA Institute and there are certain clause and regulations so when you become a member of CFA Institute you have to sign something called professional conduct statement right so if you have made certain disclosure they'll ask you certain questions has any litigation pending against you any civil litigation any criminal investigation going against you and you have to make self disclosure and if that disclosure is found to be false then an inquiry will be set up against you and certain actions may be taken right so the moment you are making self disclosure in professional conduct statement you have to ensure that you are filling all the information correctly right or if cfa institute professional conduct program receives any complaint against you then the inquiry will be done by the staff of cfa professional conduct program this is the first point sometimes what happen some written complaint about any member now the point is somebody says hey, sir i am a cfa candidate but i am not a cfa institute member so what is the difference between a cfa candidate and a cfa member in order to take membership of cfa institute you have to pay a certain amount which is 150 dollar this is the fee you have to pay annually to become cfa institute member and then you have to sign professional conduct statement so there are two criteria basically one is you have to pay a membership annual membership fee of 150 dollar if i remember correctly it is 150 dollar and then you have to sign something called professional conduct statement a cfa candidate says that at this point of time i don't want to become a member of cfa institute right so although he is appearing for cfa program but he has not opted for cfa institute membership as of now and that is quite possible now the point is i am talking about professional conduct program so does it mean that all this professional conduct program can handle queries related only to cfa institute member or it can be related to any cfa candidate also it can be related to any cfa candidate also who is not a member of cfa institute somebody was trying to ask any question 275 rupees sir fee जो सीएपी मेंबरशिप की फी है टू सेवेंटी फाइव डॉलर अभी हो गई बच्चे आई एम नॉट अवेयर बट आई थिंक उसमें वन फिफ्टी था व्हाट एवर इट इस यू हैव टू पे अ मेंबरशिप फी द अमाउंट आई एम नॉट शर बट टिल द लास्ट टाइम इफ आई रिमेम्बर आई यूज्ड टू पे वन फिफ्टी डॉलर मेरे को आइडिया नहीं है बच्चे right if i am a cfa charter holder if i need to use my designation that every year then every year i have to pay this membership fee of 150 or 275 whatever it is kuch membership fee mein kuch discount bhi milta hai if you do it before certain period of time 30th july se pehle hota hai to 150 aisa kuch hai i don't remember exactly but anyways it is not important here what is more important that you have to pay a fee is 150 dollar or 275 dollar and then you have to sign a professional conduct statement but the point which i am making here is that professional conduct program is it possible for professional conduct program to initiate any sort of an inquiry against somebody who is not a cfa institute member if you are a cfa candidate and if any complaint comes against you although you are not a member or although you are not a cfa institute member but still that inquiry can be initiated against you any complaint comes regarding your professional conduct then this inquiry can be initiated right if anything comes regarding misconduct of 
any CFA candidate or a member. See here, I'm using two words. This is very important for you to understand. I'm saying candidate or member. So if you are a CFA candidate, that does, that does not mean that you are a CFA institute member. For membership, you have to pay fee and sign PCS. So if any complaint or if any evidence of misconduct by any member or candidate comes, is received through public sources, although nobody has made any complaints against you, but if any evidence of misconduct comes through public sources, maybe through media articles, broadcast, any article, on internet through that if any evidence of misconduct is witnessed so in that case also they can initiate an inquiry against you right if you are a CFA candidate if you are sitting for your CFA exam right and the exam proctor if you sees any sort of a violation which you have done during examination in that case or in that case also an inquiry will be initiated against you right or what you have done because what happens is in CFA exam you are not supposed to disclose what sort of a question or any content related to CFA examination has to be disclosed in the public so you cannot say like this ki aapke baar ke exam mein fixed income ke zyada question the kam question the fixed income ke difficult the ye sab aap public mein discuss nahi kar sakte even after examination, if you're coming out of the exam hall and if you start discussing questions which were asked in the exam with your fellow candidates, that is also a violation. So in analysis of your exam material and if CF Institute finds that you are discussing anything about the exam content or exam material on any platform, in that case also an inquiry will be initiated against you now what happens in this inquiry right so the staff member of professional conduct program may ask you to give your explanation in writing right about whatever be the subject matter or the candidate so in that case also you have to give a written explanation right they can interview the subject matter or the candidate they can have a discussion with you right if anybody has made a complaint against you they can interview that complainant also or any other third party they can interview right and they have the right to collect all sort of documents and records relevant to the investigation all these are rights of staff member of professional contact program now once the inquiry is over then what will be the outcome in that case maybe that they'll take no disciplinary action against you because they didn't find any evidence or maybe they can issue a cautionary letter that in future you should not be doing such things or they can discipline the member or candidate if they find that the violation is a oh, it's a severe violation then in that case what happens they can revoke your membership or they can debar you from appearing from CFA program now whatever is the outcome of your professional conduct program inquiry as a member or as a candidate you have a right that you might accept or reject the decision right so if you decide that okay fine violations you know uh, sanction has been imposed on me and I am not ready to accept it so I am rejecting it in that case what happens you can reject the sanction and then the matter goes to a disciplinary review committee so there is something called disciplinary review panel so whatever is the outcome of professional conduct program inquiry if you reject it then the matter goes to disciplinary review panel right for hearing now sanctions i have already discussed sanctions might happen that your membership will be revoked or you might be debarred from appearing from cfa exam for whole life also but you have a choice that if you're not accepting the decision of pcp then you can go to disciplinary review panel right any question related to this
you can ask because this is a new section which has been included in the syllabus for 2022 earlier all this was not a part of syllabus so that is why i found it very very important to discuss whatever new things are included there is a high probability that you might be tested here if you are having any question related to this then we can discuss otherwise we'll move on i hope everything is clear guys any question related to this sir i don't know whether it related or not but sir jaise ye aapne membership fees ke liye bataya सर मेंबरशिप अगर किसी एयर या ड्रॉप कर दिए नहीं दी और अगले साल पे कर दी तो वही जितने पीरियड तक नहीं पे किया उतने उतने पीरियड तक आप मेंबर नहीं रहोगे फिर दोबारा बन जाओगे जब पे कर दोगे एंड वो सी एफ होल्डर का टैग यूज नहीं कर सकते नहीं कर सकते सर उसके लिए आपको सी एफ एच का मेंबर होना जरूरी है ओके सर और सर ये मेंबरशिप के मेजर बेनिफिट क्या होते हैं दे कंडक्ट सेवरल काइंड ऑफ सेमिनार्स एंड बहुत सारे एक्टिविटीज करते सो यूल गेट डिस्काउंट इन इन एवरी थिंग देर मेनी बेनिफिट्स राइट उनके कमिटीज में भी आप जा सकते हो बहुत सारे बेनिफिट्स हैं फॉर दैट यू हैव टू रीड सकते हैं समथिंग कॉल स्टैंडर्ड्स ऑफ प्रैक्टिस बुक जो उनका आता है वो आप पढ़ सकते हो ठीक है मूविंग ऑन टू कोड ऑफ एथिक्स राइट नाउ देर आर सिक्स कोड ऑफ एथिक्स what kind of a question might be asked they might ask you question only one question is generally framed from code of ethics and they'll ask you which of the following is not a part of code of ethics so if you remember these six points you will be able to answer the question what they say the first code of ethics is you must act with integrity competence diligence and in respect and in ethical manner with public your clients your prospective clients to everyone to the employers your colleagues so with to everybody with everybody you should act with integrity competence diligence and respect what is the meaning of integrity here what is the meaning of integrity here anyone who want to explain what is integrity if you are dealing in capital markets if you are working in capital markets what is the integrity integrity means here what you should not try to manipulate the stock prices you should not do anything which is actually hampering or which is actually uh hampering the integrity of capital markets right competence if you are working as a research analyst and if you are not competent enough which means what you don't have the requisite skills which means what you lack competence diligence if you are doing any sort of a research and you are not doing a comprehensive or a thorough research if you are trying to find out the value of a company and you are just taking numbers and punching it in an excel sheet and you are not doing any analysis as such on your own which means what you lack diligence in your research respect you should respect your profession if you are working in investment management industry and in every meeting you start abusing or you start uh, saying something about your profession which is actually not taken in you know good terms so in that case also you are trying to you are not respecting your profession now somebody will say ki if you are not respecting your profession then uh, how come this is a violation of code of ethics see what happens if you are not respecting your profession so anybody or any person who is willing to come in this profession they might be scared to enter such a profession right so you are maligning the image of this profession and that is not at all acceptable so there are four keywords here that you must act with integrity you should have competence you should do due diligence in any sort of analysis and you should respect your profession this is first code of ethics right second one is again integrity right here i was talking about integrity of individuals right then what does integrity mean here here what they say you need to place the integrity of your profession and interest of clients above your own interest so if you are working for your clients so your clients interest always comes first so if you think that a particular stock 
is good for investment purpose it is your responsibility to first give opportunity to your client to act on that information and then only you should act on that information so clients interest always comes first right the first integrity which i talked about here i was talking about integrity of capital markets now here i am talking about integrity of individuals integrity of individual here means what as a investment professional it is your responsibility that you should give your give chance to your client to act first on any information right and then so the uh, our bottom line is client's interest always comes first what do you mean by integrity of capital markets here if you're involved in any sort of a price rigging or manipulation which means what you're compromising with the integrity of capital markets so here i was talking about the integrity of the global capital markets and here in the second point i was talking about integrity of individuals third code of ethics says what use reasonable care and exercise independence independence in doing what in any sort of analysis which you are doing or if you are making any investment recommendation or if you are taking any investment action or if you are engaged in any professional activity you should use reasonable care and exercise independence if you are an investment advisor so when you are in advising your client about any sort of a security so in that case you have to ensure that that particular security or product is suitable for your client exercising independence means what if you are preparing a research report it should be independent so if you are preparing a research report on reliance industries limited and if you are getting influenced by management of reliance industries limited in that case in there is a higher probability that you should that you issue a favorable report right so that report will not be independent fourth code of ethics says what practice and encourage others to practice in a professional and ethical manner that will bring repute to you and your profession also right so fourth point says what it is not it is not only that you are acting in a ethical and professional manner you should encourage others also to practice ethical behavior right and fifth code of ethics says what you need to promote the integrity of and uphold rules right for ultimate benefit of the society now here the code has actually changed a little bit now the fifth code of ethics what they say you need to promote the integrity and viability of global market, capital market. of global capital market so that it is beneficial for the society earlier the code of ethics was saying that you need to uphold rules governing capital market so obviously there is a regulator they have framed certain rules and you need to uphold but now this code of ethics has been changed a little bit and they say you need to promote the integrity and viability of global capital markets what do you mean by viability here if you are a stock broker and if you start charging arbitrary fee from your clients which means what you are not working in the best interest of your clients right and that is going to have a negative impact on global capital markets also because investors might be disinterested in investing in capital markets sixth code of ethics says what maintain and improve professional competence right not only your professional competence if you are skilled enough to do any sort of analysis if you are a research analyst and you feel that you are good at it that does not mean that you will not upgrade your skills upgradation of skills is very very important and if i am a supervisor supervising a, a group of research analysts so it is my responsibility that i should upgrade my skills as well as i have to ensure that my subordinates they are also upgrading their skills so these are the six code of ethics and the only question which might be asked in examination is which of the following they'll give you three options and they'll ask you which of the following is not a part of code of ethics so if you remember these six points then it will help you in answering the question what i did i just used simple uh, this kind of a 
uh, you know what uh, what do you call it key so you can frame your key also to under to just remember what are the keywords here or as a be a practice karoge it will be easy for you to remember any question related to code of ethics you can ask sir yes sir sir uh, code number 3 sir use reasonable care sir ye thoda dobara batayein use reasonable care karne ka matlab kya hua agar aap apne client ko koi bhi product suggest kar rahe ho and if that product is not suitable for your client which means what are you using reasonable care are you being careful to your client if stock market is doing well and your client he is under so much liability so are you going to advise your client to invest in stock market no sir if you are doing any sort of a research right or research mein aap kya kar rahe ho you are just taking data from some sources which are not reliable are you being reasonable no sir so these are the examples of you know what you are reasonable here uh, okay. sir second point okay. samjha na integrity of individual kaun sa bachche uh second integrity point. Of, integrity of individuals right y yes sir okay here integrity means what man lo ek stock ka aapko idea aaya aapne to soch ke aapko laga ki infosys is a very good stock sabse pehle aap apna paisa laga dete ho fir apne client ko batate ho okay so what here what i said your client's interest always comes first yeah so you're compromising with the interest of your client is your integrity intact no Okay. If you're cheating, if you're cheating with your client, is your integrity intact? If you're giving any sort of advisory to your client which is not suitable for your client, is your integrity intact? No. So what it says, you have to maintain your integrity. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's move on. So this was all about code of ethics. Now I'll move on to standards. and this is the most important part of your ethics now there are seven standards and how do i remember these standards so maine ek key bana liya uske liye and what was my key so i remembered like this pies icr this is how i remembered when i appeared for my exam so there are seven standards and within every standard there will be sub standards so the first standard is professionalism so my first standard is professionalism second standard is integrity of capital markets the second standard is integrity of capital markets your third standard is duties to clients duties to clients this e stands for duties to employers see what i did p stands for professionalism i stands for integrity c for client e for employer and then again i this i means investment analysis this is all related to whatever analysis you have done for any investment so investment analysis then your recommendations and whatever actions you have taken then the c stands for conflict of interest this is your conflict of interest and this r stands for responsibility whose responsibility the responsibility as a cfa institute member or cfa candidate now these are seven standards within each standard there will be different sub standards right so i'll start the discussion with the first standard which is professionalism so let us start the discussion and the first standard which we are going to discuss is professionalism this is standard 1 now within this standard there will be there are four sub standards so the first sub standard is knowledge of law which i am writing here is 1a this one means this is first standard and this is sub standard a of first standard so the first standard which we are covering here is professionalism and within that standard the first sub standard is knowledge of law remember two things which is very very important for you there is something called requirement and there is something called recommendation there is something called requirement and there is something called recommendation 
what CFA institute says, whatever is the requirement you have to fulfill, you cannot avoid it. Right? There is no option for you. You must adhere to all requirements. Recommendation means what? If you don't follow those recommendations, it's not a violation. But if you are not following requirements, then it is a violation. Right? So recommend, requirement is must. Recommendation is optional. Recommendation means in, the, in, a, in a particular scenario, you should act like this. If you are fo not following, then it is not a violation. This is just a recommendation being given by CFA Institute. But if you are not following a requirement, then it's a violation. In this slide, all the requirements I have mentioned, I have more not mentioned about recommendation, right? So whatever is written here, all these are requirements. Recommendation we are going to discuss with different case studies, right? So the first substandard within standard one is knowledge of law. What it says, you must understand and comply with applicable laws, rules and regulations. If you are working in a Indian stock market, and then you did something which is a violation and then you claim that ki mujhe to pata hi nahi tha ki aisa koi lobby hota hai that that does not mean that you are not under violation you have violated it is your responsibility to understand all laws rules and regulation you cannot say that since i didn't know the law and that's how the violation happened that is not acceptable so you must understand laws rules and regulation and you must comply you cannot evade your responsibility by just saying that i was not aware it is your responsibility to understand all the laws rules and regulations now what happens in the event of conflict let's say cfa institute has given this standards of professional conduct a country has certain different laws i will make example i take let's say if you do any sort of a manipulation in capital market right then indian market says that you will be penalized and you will be debarred from capital market for seven years cfa institute says what let's say you'll be debarred for five years there is a conflict in that case, what will happen? You'll have to follow the stricter one, whichever is stricter, which is stricter here, Indian laws. Or let's say CFNs would say that betting is, you should not do betting, right? In a country like Australia, let's say betting is legal. Then if you are a CFN should member, what you should do? Which one is more stricter? Obviously, not allowing betting is more stricter so you should follow this one because here there's a conflict if you're working in australian capital market and betting is legal there but cfa institute says that betting is not betting is not allowed betting is not ethical and in that case what will happen there's a conflict of interest in that case you have to follow the stricter one whichever is stricter right third point says what you must not knowingly participate or assist in violation of rules laws and regulation and must disassociate if you feel that any of your colleague they are a part of any sort of a violation and if you are aware about it then immediately you should disassociate yourself from such activities right if you know something is happening and if you're not taking an action that is also a violation right next point says do not violate code or standards even if the activity is otherwise legal the same point which i talked about in australia betting is legal right but standard says no betting you should not do betting so in that case what happens you will say oh this betting is legal in this country so i can go for it even if that activity is legal right but if cf institute code of code or standard says what that this is not ethical then in that case you should follow the stricter one as simple as that something which is legal i have already discussed there is something which is legal but it is not ethical so you must follow the stricter one next point says what inaction with continued association may be construed as knowing participation you are aware that some kind of a manipulation is happening some kind of a violation is happening in your organization right and although you are not a part of it and still you continued so it says what 
in action with continued association may be construed as knowing participation which means what they are going to say that you are also a part of violation because you didn't take any action you should have disassociated yourself from an activity maybe in extreme cases you should have resigned from the organization and you should clearly document all those things but you didn't do any uh, you didn't take any action so this inaction may be construed as if you were also a part of it right next point says that if any such activity is happening there is no requirement that you immediately approach government authorities yes in some cases it is mandatory for you to approach government authority if any sort of a money laundering happening related to any terrorist activities and you are aware about it then you should immediately report to government authorities so only in exceptional cases right not in every cases it is required that you approach the regulator or the government authorities right so these are the points which are important as far as knowledge of capital market is concerned right any question related to whatever we have discussed till now you can ask yes sir any question anyone having any doubt or any question you can ask asita chabra any question fifth point fifth point one two in action with continued association may be construed as knowing participation what does it mean aapko pata tha ki kuch na kuch violations ho raha aapke organizations mein aapke co-workers aapke colleagues kuch na kuch kar rahe the you didn't take any action aapne bola you are not a part of it right and you continued with it which means what it will be treated as if you are also a part of this violation so it says what in action with continued association because you didn't take any action you could have disassociated yourself from the organization maybe from that department but you don't do it right so that is what it says that if you're not acting or you're in action with continued association it might be construed as if you are also a part of violation is it clear okay any other question guys third and fourth point third point what i said must not knowingly participate or assist in violation okay aapko pata hai ki bhai any violation is happening right so if you know some violation is happening although you are not doing any violation but that does not mean that ki aap kuch nahi karoge aapko kya karna chahiye you should disassociate yourself aap alag ho jao us department se us organization se you should take any action maybe you can report all these activities to your supervisor but aapne kuch nahi kiya that is also a violation is it okay fourth point maine kya bola by don't violate code or standards even if the activity is otherwise legal what does it mean a betting is legal in australia right and if you are also a part of betting but cfa your code or standard says what betting is not ethical so which which one you have to follow you have to follow the stricter one which one is more stricter cfa should code of standards they say betting should not be allowed so in that case you cannot claim that oh, since the betting is there, since betting is legal in this country and that's why i did betting that is also a violation is it clear guys shall i move on to the second uh, substandard b okay also uh, one small question yes sir um since i have to always put my client's needs first uh -huh. so i'm dealing with a client who is working in uh, australia uh, who is from australia and uh, he is asking me to uh, put his money uh, like in a deal where it's basically i get to know that the deal is uh, dealing in betting and uh, codes of standard like my uh, like i'm not allowed to do but since i have to uh, comply with my client and i have to do it for a client will it still be yes, it's, it's it's a violation sir it's a violation because cfa institute code of standard says what that betting is not ethical hmm. right client interest always comes first that does not mean that whatever client is saying you'll do it okay right and uh, so in uh, exam what kind of questions we can uh... they can they'll give you certain case study jaise aapne abhi question pucha na danish 
this mm. is a kind of a case study they'll give you certain examples and then ask you whether this guy is under violation or not so mere ko ye sab uh, whatever you are teaching i should just know uh, understand it properly instead of yes. uh, throwing, uh, thoroughly so you don't have to mug up anything i don't if have you to understand if you understand whatever we are discussing through examples na you'll be able to remember in exam also you don't have to remember each and every point right yes. mugging up nahi karna इंडिपेंडेंसिटी if you are working as a research analyst and if you are preparing a research report for reliance industries limited and if you go to agm of reliance industries aur us agm mein aapko reliance industries ki taraf se bahut hi acche acche gifts mil rahe hain if you are getting gifts there is a high probability that while preparing your report you might be biased and you might issue a favorable report and that will be in that case you'll be compromising with the interest of your clients because the inter- client wants you to give an independent report right so if you are accepting any sort of a gift from the subject company on which you are preparing a report there is a high probability that your report might be biased so here independence will be compromised what is the meaning of objectivity here right whenever you write a research report there has to be an objective so if you are preparing a research report in reliance industries limited right and your objective is that you want to give your client a price target for reliance industries limited for next 6 months at the end of the report you don't give any price recommendation and you give a wide range you give that price might vary from 800 to 1600 are you being objective here no right so independence and objectivity is very very important so the very first point says what that you must not offer solicit or accept any gift benefit or consider consideration that might compromise with your independence it's not only about your independence and objectivity it's about another's independence and objectivity also now in this case somebody will ask a question sir as a analyst i attended agm of reliance there was a investors uh, there was a analyst conference call and reliance industry limited gifted a pen to every analyst shall i accept it or no modest gifts are permitted there is no problem with modest gift but any gift right any substantial gift or any gift which is not modest it should not be accepted right because if you are accepting any lavish gifts then there is high probability that your independence might be compromised third point says allocation of shares in oversubscribed ipos to personal account is not permitted what does it mean you are a investment banker it is your now you are doing allocation of shares so let's say uh, for a ipo how many applications came let's say the application came for 1 crore shares right and the company had to issue only 50 lakh shares so the public issue was for only 50 lakh shares and application came for 1 crore shares which means what it is oversubscribed by company ko issue karna tha 50 lakh shares but application came for 1 crore shares if you are investment banker and if you are a merchant banker and you are doing allocation of oversubscribed ipo in that case what it says if you have applied in your account then in that case what you should do first you should give chance to your clients or investors right so first you need to allocate shares to your clients and investors and then you can think about your own account right if you are allocating shares to your account first and then you are giving a chance to your clients and investors then this is also a violation so what it says being a merchant banker allocation of shares in oversubscribed ipos to personal account is not permitted it is not allowed. if you are receiving any sort of a gift from anywhere 
you need to disclose it to your employer. If you are working as a research analyst with JP Morgan and if you are preparing a research report on Reliance Industries Limited and if you receive any sort of a gift, make sure that you disclose it to your employer. Right. Next important point says what? Make sure that there are effective firewalls between research and investment management and investment banking activities. Okay. Now this is a very important point here. Let's say Paytm plans to launch an IPO. They want to tap the capital market. They want to issue shares in the market. They approach JP Morgan. Right. So JP Morgan is the investment banker here. Now JP Morgan has an investment banking division and they have a research division also. Right. Now what is the role of investment banker here? So all the investment banking personals they'll ensure that JP Morgan ka jo IPO oversubscribed ho jai, ya fully subscribed ho jai. So they'll try and push in the capital market. They'll do all sort of road shows, activities just to ensure that this IPO successful ho jai. Or pricing be achieved because obviously PTM why they have given this mandate to JP Morgan because they believe that these guys can push my IPO in the market and they can get me a better pricing now JP Morgan has two divisions one is your investment banking division and the second one is their research division what happens all these sales guys of investment banking team they might try and pressurize the research team to issue a favorable report on Paytm so that perception can be created in the minds of investor that this IPO is good and we should subscribe to it right in this case what it says the research team will not be independent and their independence is getting compromised so there has to be a firewall all communication between investment banking team and research team should go through a compliance department so you need to ensure that these guys are not pressurizing the research guys to issue any sort of a favorable report and that is what it says here that there has to be an effective firewall between research investment management and investment banking activities because what is the benefit of these investment banking guys if they issue a favorable report it is creating a positive it's creating a perception in the mind of investor this idea is good we should subscribe to it although it is not favorable for investors but under pressure from investment banking team they might issue a favorable report so all communication which is happening between these two department has to go through a compliance department and there has to be a firewall right so this was about this point okay then it says if you are a research analyst and if you are preparing a research report and how you are preparing a research report you are just consulting with the management of the company you are preparing a research report on PTM you are discussing with Mr. Vijay Shekhar Sharma and the top management and you are issuing a research report is it comprehensive no you should prepare a comprehensive report that should not only be confined to the management of the company rather you should use variety of sources by in the customer con in the customer se baat karin, the competitor analysis competition analysis karo, and then you talk to suppliers also right so there are so many things which has to be a part of research report it should not be a mere discussion with the top management of the company so you should prepare a comprehensive research report next point says what you need to create a restricted list what does it mean if JP Morgan is trying to bring out FPO follow on public offer of Reliance Industries Limited right which means what they have the mandate follow on public offer means this is not for the first time the same company is issuing shares for the second or third time or fourth time and the shares are already getting traded in the market so it is the responsibility of JP Morgan to create a restricted list which means what once they have got a mandate so the management and the employees of JP Morgan has the insider information so they should debar their employees from participating or buying and selling of the subject company so in stock market what they'll say you cannot trade in reliance industries limited issue till the time the ipo goes through or the fpo goes through 
right so they'll create restricted list in which they'll say now these are the securities in which our employees our management cannot trade and i'm talking from the perspective of this investment banker jp morgan they have the mandate maybe if you are working for icici securities as a research analyst and if you're preparing a research report on Reliance Industry Limited, in that case also, it might happen that ICS Securities will tell you all their employees that not to trade in Reliance Industries Limited stock. So here, it is important that as an employee also, you should know what are the securities in which you cannot trade in your personal account. Here, I'm talking about personal account, not in client's account, right? So this was about standard 1B, which is independence and objectivity any question you have please ask so so uh, just like you gave an example for jp morgan working on an ipo for a company uh -huh. so is it like uh, essential that all my employees who are getting involved in working for that uh, for the preparation of an ipo that i do bar them from applying for that IPO, like I restrict them from applying it. Like, is it essential or is it like a part CFA, of my code? CFA code and standard says what? That you can apply. But if it is oversubscribed, then if you're allocating shares in your personal account, that is not permitted. If Reliance Industry is limited, is coming out with an IPO and you want to apply in your personal account, you can do that. But if this issue is getting oversubscribed and you're allocating shares in your personal account, then it is not permitted. Okay, okay. Applying, see, recommend, again, I'll say this is a requirement. Recommendation will say what? Okay, you fine, you can apply. But in recommendation, they'll say you should avoid applying. That does not mean that you can apply. You can apply. There's no foundation. You can apply. But if the issue is getting oversubscribed and if you're allocating shares in your personal account and you're not giving a chance to your clients, then it is a violation. Is it clear now? So I understood this, but I didn't understand uh, a cre uh, creation of a restricted list. What point of view is here? Creation of restricted list. See, what happens? ICS securities when you're working as a research analyst. And you are preparing a report on a particular company. So you have insider information. Abhi report tayar nahi hai, lekin aapke paas to sara information hai. If you feel that this stock is a good stock and you should buy it, so before giving a chance to your client, you'll buy in your personal account. Yes. There's a possibility. Us case mein company kya karte? Restricted list laga dete. Agar ye company pe hamare research report bana rahe, to hamare employees us pe trade nahi kar sakte. Okay. 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 Got it. Right. Any other sir, question, guys? Yes, sir. Sir, अगर उसके personal जो belongings मतलब personal जैसे family members से किसी के भी related में ऐसा कोई आया तब भी charges होते हैं। अब इसमें इसमें देखो इसमें बच्चा recommendation तो यही बोलता है कि भाई मत करो because अगर आप अपनी wife के account में ले रहे हो तो you are the ultimate beneficiary। Yeah। तो ultimately if you are a beneficiary then you should not do it। लेकिन अगर आप बोलते हो कि नहीं मेरी wife मेरे से separate है and she never discusses with me Go ahead, no problem. Recommendation kya bole ka ke wife ko bhi mana karo. Because your husband and wife, obviously you might discuss. Basically unethical ho gaya, but legal hai. Dekho legal country, legal mein isle nahi bol sakta na, bachche bachche hume har ek country ka rule alag alag hai. Right? Agar aap mein bolo ke illegal hai, ta aap koi bolega nahi sir, Australia mein to illegal hai ta, then what will I say? तो मैं ऐसे देख सकता हूँ कि it is unethical in unethical globally but it is legal in India because वो wife का account है it has nothing to do with me तो उस केस में क्या होगा conflict of interest हो गया तो हमें क्या करना पड़ेगा बच्चे we follow the stricter law अच्छा हर एक चीज का उपाय दिया हुआ है इन्होंने दिया ठीक है okay thank you sir okay जी let's move on अगर कोई और doubt नहीं है तो I'll move on to standard one C, which is misrepresentation. Okay. There's a difference between fact and opinion, right? <clears throat> and you should always differentiate between fact and opinion. I'm giving you one example. I say, next year, this stock will give you 20% return. Is it a fact or opinion? Opinion, sir, opinion. opinion. But I'm representing it as a fact. 
मैंने बोला दिस स्टॉक विल गिव यू ट्वेंटी परसेंट रिटर्न मैंने कहीं ये तो नहीं बोला कि आई बिलीव दैट दिस स्टॉक माइट गिव यू ट्वेंटी परसेंट रिटर्न एक्चुअल दिस इज अ ओपिनियन बट आई एम रिप्रेजेंटिंग इट एज अ फैक्ट राइट दिस इज अ वायलेशन अगर मैंने बोला दिस स्टॉक विल गिव यू ट्वेंटी परसेंट रिटर्न नो बडी कैन गारंटी द परफॉर्मेंस इन स्टॉक मार्केट राइट this is opinion but i am presenting it as a fact fact is something which can be verified opinion is something which cannot be verified agar mera opinion hai ki stock agle saal mein there is a possibility ki 20% return there this is opinion but when i say the stock will give you 20% return which means what a opinion is being presented as a fact and this is a violation right so when you are making any recommendation don't misrepresent fact jo fact hai usko clearly state karo don't misrepresent it if you are doing misrepresentation then this is a violation and misrepresentation does not mean ki aapne koi electronically communicate kiya through mail agar aapne orally bhi kisi se communicate kiya aur bola koi misrepresentation kiya then also it is a violation so violation can happen through oral and electronic communication then you will say ki sir uska proof kya hai everything is circumstantial evidence right now what do you mean by circumstantial evidence ek भाई सब मरे हुए और चाकू लेके आप उसके ऊपर खड़े हुए हो राइट किसी ने आपको ये नहीं देखा कि आपको चाकू मारते हुए नहीं देखा बट ऑन द स्पॉट यू आर हैविंग नाइफ इन योर हैंड एंड द पर्सन वाज लाइंग राइट उसके खून बह रहा था तो सरकमस्टैंशियल एविडेंस क्या बोलेगा यू ऑब्वियसली यू हैव मर्डर्ड दैट पर्सन सो ऑल दिस इज सरकमस्टैंशियल एविडेंस राइट एंड सरकमस्टैंशियल एविडेंस के थ्रू ही प्रूव हो सकता है बिकॉज़ इफ यू टॉक अबाउट इनसाइड अ ट्रेड इनसाइड अ ट्रेड को कोई प्रूव नहीं कर सकता दिस कैन बी प्रूव्ड ओनली थ्रू सरकमस्टैंशियल एविडेंस सो इफ अ स्टॉक स्टार्ट्स गोइंग अप टुमारो एट 12:00 एंड यू बॉट द स्टॉक एट 11:55 एंड द स्टॉक स्टार्ट यू नो स्टार्टेड गोइंग अप उससे पहले स्टॉक में 2-4 हजार शेयर में ट्रेड होता था उसके बाद अचानक 1 लाख शेयर में ट्रेड होने लगा आप क्या बोलोगे regulator will say how come that you bought the stock 5 minutes before the start stock started going up you will say ki mere sapne mein bhagwan ji aaye the and he told me khareed lo right ek bari hoga do bari hoga har ek bar to aisa nahi ho sakta na so regulator will say har ek bar sapne mein tabhi aate hai bhagwan ji 5 minute pehle all this is circumstantial evidence right so what i am saying here is misrepresentation is not only electronic communication it could be oral communication also misrepresentation includes guaranteeing investment performance okay which means what you are saying uh, definitely this stock will give you 20% return this is opinion being presented as a fact you cannot perform as guarantee in stock market nobody can guarantee return in stock market right and plagiarism what is plagiarism it simply says what that you are preparing a report and you copied some material from some sources and you didn't give any credit to that person that is also a violation right so plagiarism includes what it means if you are using someone else's work kisi ke report se aapne kuch bhi utha ke apne report mein dal diya koi bhi forecast koi bhi charts koi bhi graphics spreadsheet without giving them due credit then it is a violation but remember here one thing if you are quoting anything from public sources ab rbi ke report se agar aapne kuch quote kiya that is a public source us case mein if you are not giving a credit then it is not a violation right so you have to differentiate here if the question says it is a public source in which you have quoted some data graphics or whatever it is and you didn't give credit is it a violation no then it is not a violation but through private sources right usme se agar aapne kuch bhi copy kiya without giving them due credit in your report then it is a violation next point which i talked about just now information from recognized financial and statistical reporting services need not be cited in this case you need not be mentioning the source of information right if you are working for an insurance company if you are working for a stock broking firm let's take an example if you are working for a stock broking firm and if a client comes he says i want to buy insurance and then you say sir i'll do it don't worry i'll get that insurance product for you although your firm does not give insurance right they are not into insurance services which means what this is misrepresentation of facts you are misrepresenting the services being offered by your company in this case it is the responsibility of employer to give employees a written list of whatever services the firm is offering right and 
if you say sir i'll arrange it from somewhere and if you're not mentioning what sort of arrangement you have with the insurance agent are you getting something out of that deal then also it is a violation right any question related to standard 1c you can ask go sir, ahead please. yes sir जो हम सेकंड लास्ट पॉइंट डिस्कस कर रहे हैं कि हम रिसोर्स जो रिसोर्स है उसकी हम नाम नहीं दे सकते लेकिन फिर वो कंफर्म कैसे होगा कि वो रिसोर्स सही है रेकमेंडेशन ये है कि भाई अब एक बात बताओ अब कोई बहुत बड़ा आरबीआई का अगर आरबीआई के उससे अगर आप ये कर रहे हो कोट कर रहे हो कोई इन्फॉर्मेशन राइट गलत होने के क्या चांसेस है हाँ ये बोलना है कि सर हमने इन्फॉर्मेशन दे दिया राइट right. और okay. हमने मेंशन नहीं किया तो इन्वेस्टर को कैसे पता चलेगा या किसी और को कैसे पता चलेगा वो कितना रिलायबल है अगर रिलायबिलिटी चेक करनी है पब्लिक सोर्सेज में इन्फॉर्मेशन आप चेक कर लो ओके सर एनी अदर क्वेश्चन गाइस दिस नो क्वेश्चन आई विल मूव ऑन टू नेक्स्ट स्टैंडर्ड व्हिच इज स्टैंडर्ड 1 डी मिसकंडा और इट सेस Don't engage in any activities related to dishonesty, fraud, and deceit. That is a part of misconduct. Nothing to explain here. Don't do anything which poorly reflects on your integrity, your reputation, or on your professional competence. I'll just give you an example. I am working for a firm, right? I am working as an investment banker. During lunch, I am working for investment banking firm. During lunch, I go to the canteen. I sit with my colleagues and I start abusing my profession. Is it a violation? Yes, it is a violation. During lunch break, I take beer or alcohol, whatever it is, and I start abusing people. Is it a violation? Yes, it is a violation. But somebody will say, during lunch break, you know what? I was just, I was just feeling frustrated with my job and with this kind of a profession. So that's why, you know what? I started abusing it. The point here is, if you are not satisfied, that's okay. But why you are saying such things in public, which means what? You are trying to disrepute the profession also. That's a part of misconduct, right? Next point is very very important. Don't abuse CFA Institute Professional Conduct Program by seeking enforcement of this standard to settle personal, political, or other disputes that are not related to professional ethics. Me and Mangesh, we are working for the same organization, right? Mangesh Dam does something which is a violation, but my motive, I complain against uh, uh, Mangesh to my supervisor or to CFA Institute Professional Conduct Program. My motive was just to settle my score with Mangesh because I had a fight with Mangesh last night, so I complained to CFA Institute. All right. So in that case, if Mangesh has done a violation, so there is a possibility that CFA should conduct program. They might say that, okay, Mangesh has also done a violation, but you are also part of the violation because you have not complained just to ensure that, you know what, just to bring his uh, violation to the notice of CFA Institute, but your motive was to settle your personal score, right? Yeah, aapka political belief, alaga. I am a supporter of a political party ABC, you are a supporter of political party DEF. And I just made a complaint against you just to settle my political rival. That is also a violation. Right. The next point says, give employees a list of potential violations and sanctions including dismissal. Kaniga matlab, if you are an employer, you need to provide do's and don'ts to your employees. Unko pehle se pata hona chahiye, ye kar sakte, ye kaam nahi kar sakte. And if you do this, then what are the sanctions which can be imposed on you that has to be disclosed right as an employer if you are hiring sorry as an employer if you are hiring employees it is your responsibility to check their references right the next point is very very important it says this standard does not cover Legal transgressions resulting from acts of civil disobedience in support of personal belief. Okay, I was a part of Anna movement. I, have a, I am an investment banker. I was a part of Anna movement. That was a civil disobedience movement. So out of my personal belief, I attended that movement. I went to jail. Right? Is it a crime? No. It, this standard says what? 
that out of your postal belief, if you are a part of civil disobedience movement and if you went to jail, that's not a violation. Right? So I just give you this example because this example is apt for this particular point. Right, so this was about standard 1D. Any question related to standard 1D, 1C, now you can ask. Please go ahead and ask all your doubts. Any question or anything you are not able to understand. Bole sir, Pratik ji. Clear sir. 